Hamlet, perhaps the world's most famous play. And the eternal unanswered question is, why so famous? Why this story? Is it, of all stories told for the theatre, the most universal? The story of a prince who risks everything in his life, discarding his love, challenging his mother, feigning madness to buy himself time to confirm his mission to avenge his father's murder. Is that a universal pattern? Is that what all theatre goers most readily find within ourselves? A royal revenger? Perhaps we do all secretly like to think of ourselves as royals. A philosopher prince who thinks deeply about the nature of the world and human life, stripping it to the quick, to be or not to be. Perhaps the most famous utterance in all of human history, certainly in all of drama. So is to be or not to be the most central of all questions ever asked on a stage. Human existence stripped to its most ruthless proposition. Why go on living? Consciousness of death enables the question, makes it possible, even perhaps inescapable. If you remove that meditation from the play, take away those six monosyllables, to be or not to be, and the elaborations that follow, do you still have the most famous play ever written? There are many things about that monologue that are puzzling, that float free from their context in the story, and yet perhaps in doing so reinforce its centrality or its universality, its applicability to so many situations. At any moment, you could stop and say, eh, well, I mean, to be or not to be. I want to look at that in a separate short video. For now, let's consider the play as a whole. A long, long play, the longest its author ever wrote. If you perform it entire, over most of uh, five hours, few productions, attempted, all the fewer now that our concentration span has shrunk in an age of sound bites. On the one hand, quite straightforward story, easily told, Hamlet, a prince whose kingly father dies while uh, he's away, the son at university, comes home to a double shock. His uncle, his king's brother, the king's brother, has taken over uh, the throne and his wife is, the, is Hamlet's mother, now his queen. So uh, why is the second shock so much greater for Hamlet? Uh, he doesn't seem tremendously upset about having missed the chance to be the next king, which perhaps he should be, or perhaps it's uh, the king's uh, brother who is next in line to the throne. We never get told. But the main issue uh, of Hamlet's discovery of the, the shocks that await him on return from university is that Hamlet uh, has revered his mother as a model of rectitude, of virtue. Now it seems maybe she's just a, a base, a vulgar opportunist. Or maybe she's always loved her brother-in-law, in which case she's been an out-and-out -out liar for most of uh, all of Hamlet's adult life and a, a successful poser. And now it seems maybe Hamlet's ultimate role model, his mother, is a fake. Either way, uh, for Hamlet, his mother's sudden vault farce is far more shocking than his uncle popping in, as Hamlet casually puts it, between him and the election, i.e. the election to the throne. Politics don't interest Hamlet all that much, but reality does. An understanding of who people are or, or were, it's where sanity is based. His mother, when he last saw her, and all his life up till then, had been the perfect wife, the adoring wife, 
utterly devoted to his father, body and soul. So, his mother, not the person that he thought. And then what is he? A blind man, an idiot, a, a dupe. Seems, madam, he says to his mother. I know not seems. It's a supreme display of dramatic irony on the playwright's part, because seems is now, at this moment, the only thing that Hamlet knows, and it's what is torturing him. Then, in a form somewhat uh, uh, like, I, I, I suppose you could say, a dream, no more reliable than a dream, or, or an intuition, it comes to Hamlet that his father didn't die a natural death. His uncle, the new king, killed him, killed his brother, Hamlet's dad, to get the throne and the queen. And the spectre that tells Hamlet this appears in the form of his father dressed for battle. Can Hamlet trust this ghost? This is the pivotal issue that dominates the first half of the play and makes it so much more uh, than a tale of revenge. Now the question that raises it from a revenge story into a metaphysical one is, how do you know when revenge is valid, is justified? You have to stop and think, but pretend to be calm, it's possible. Pretend to be mad, on the other hand, that's closer to how you feel. Shakespeare found this tale of pretending in the original version or versions of the Hamlet story. And it's my uh, secret conviction that this is the piece of the puzzle that made him want to write Hamlet himself in the first place. The revenger who feigns madness so he can delay, so he can dally until his mission is confirmed. Hamlet, a good man with a good mission, but is it? We've been here before. Brutus, the tortured hero of Julius Caesar, finds himself, like Hamlet, sucked into vengeance for honour's sake, the honour of the state, yet fatally tainted by this role, tormented by a murdered victim's ghost, as Hamlet is. Brutus, poor doubting Brutus, dragged into a murderous cause by his friend Cassius, who has no doubts, Brutus turns out to have been a kind of draft for Hamlet. But Julius Caesar, the play, is short, and the language is, by Shakespearean standards, easy. Hamlet is excessively long, <laughs> the author's longest, and the language, frustratingly, for such a focused story, all but shorn of subplots, is itself tortured, beautiful and difficult. This is unexpected, self-contradictory even. Just tell us the story, Will. Can't you keep it simple, you know, like Julius Caesar? But there are distractions and they're all in Hamlet's mind, as if the play itself were taking place, not in the castle of uh, Elsinore by the sea, but in Hamlet's mind. That mind too complex for a revenger. The thinking slows him down. And the nagging problem was his father really murdered by his uncle. Even when at last he gets a measure of proof, he idles, dizzied by the moment, by the significance of everything in the moment, even the fall of a sparrow. Brutus wouldn't even have noticed the, fat, the, the, the poor sparrow. Sam Dastor, an actor friend of mine who I met in my first weeks at college, and with whom when we met, I spent two uninterrupted days comparing Shakespearean ecstasies, plunging into an obsession we shared. And we still do so now, <laughs> 60 years later, nothing much has changed. Sam ventured the theory, the theory that the play Hamlet was the novel trying to be born, the novel form. Digressive 
by nature, as Lawrence Stern, one of its founding fathers, observed, wandering around the novel, not sticking to the plot. Sam's suggestion has remained with me for these 60 years. A plausible theory, not only because Hamlet is so long, searching for a form, just as its hero does, uh, in which to contain its story, but because the play focuses so intently on the main characters on the, on the main character, are giving us his take on everything and everyone and things relevant only to the heartbeat of his mind, just as a first-person novel would. The great French symbolist poet Mallarmé wrote a species of tribute to the play in which it says, Enter Hamlet, reading from the book of himself, lisant du livre de lui-même. Just so, Freud is here anticipated, as he is in Shakespeare's play, a world in which the individual, as bare, forked creature, uh, as it says in King Lear, is important as an individual, not because of worldly rank or deeds or a remarkable nature or a remarkable situation. Prince here simply means human, important just because alive, a specimen, a prince, if you like, but in the play, a man more at home talking to gravediggers uh, than to courtiers. He makes fun of courtiers. He admires the gravediggers. In Hamlet, the individual is on the move, the individual as a concept. Today, of course, he's everywhere. He's us, he's normal. We're all special. But when 60 years after Hamlet, a Londoner called Samuel Pepys wrote the first entry in his subsequently world famous diary, the first of its kind, started noting down his daily actions, each bout of eating and lovemaking in code, without necessarily knowing it, he was promoting the everyday as an everyday individual experiences it, promoting this to the front rank of history. Soon, diaries were everywhere, and then novels were everywhere, and James Joyce was inside his character's heads for as long as anyone, even Shakespeare, could possibly have wished. So Hamlet, the world's first and eternal introvert, the model introvert, first of his kind, is that the key? to his and the play's universality. Today, navel-gazing characters are everywhere in fiction and drama, and of course in life itself. They're us. So we barely notice Hamlet's groundbreaking stance. But he remains, shall we say, the godfather of Solo. To go in a perfectly horrible pun. Uh, more on this shortly uh, when I have a go at uh, some of the myths that you will encounter along with the play uh, that cri critics and readers have uh, put together uh, for us uh, to distract us, to delude us, uh, to make us miss the point. The point being in Shakespeare, uh, the, uh, the point that he tells us. I was uh, introduced to Shakespeare at my boarding school by a great scholar, called Ronald Watkins, who was partly responsible for the creation, the recreation of the globe on uh, the south uh, bank of the Thames. Wonderful actor, wonderful scholar. He uh, wrote a book called, uh, Why Don't We Ask Shakespeare? <laughs> Which uh, reduced all the theorizing, all the uh, spurious modernity of understanding uh, to a much simpler question. Let's see what it says in the play, what a man who knew how to specify what he meant is trying to tell us. Why don't we ask Shakespeare? And uh, that's what we're going to do as we look at Hamlet and ground the ideas that so many people have had and the ideas we ourselves have uh, about uh, Hamlet, the play, in the actual lines that Shakespeare wrote. So uh, more of this soon. Thank you. Please enjoy what's left of the summer. Bye now.